Funding for Colores was provided in part by Frederick Hammersley Foundation. This time on Colores, we go on site for Tribeca Hacks Indian Country at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe. We follow one team that focuses on language preservation. It's more about people's experience with their language and it, for people that are interested in preserving their culture and their language. They heard my language speak. Nick and Kelly Lambesi create skateboards. No two are alike. One of the biggest challenges I think I face making the skateboards is to continue coming up with new designs. Smag Dance Company takes modern dance into the community. Our street performances are designed to bring audiences to the table and necessarily not have them come to a theater. An exhibit based on the work of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's intriguing character, Sherlock Holmes. It is such a fantastic combination of hands-on science and real uh, Sherlockian artifacts. It's all ahead on Colores. What is a hackathon? We're here at the Institute of American Indian Arts at the first ever Indian hackathon. So as you're scrolling down, it looks like you're cruising because these are moving. And I guess he's supposed to text you when he's done with all Hack of them. Hackathon is right. communicative, right. intense. You now work with people. You get resources. You pull people left and right to help you establish something that you know we never thought of when we got here. But now we're building something together. We are creating a website called Coyote and Eagle. We're kind of uh, utilizing those characters and kind of that, that history and that oral history to tell our story and how people are, are, are using language to preserve their culture now. Yeah, we, when we interviewed people, um, you know, they're, they're from different tribes and stuff, and we had, we had uh, questions that kind of aroused, you know, what they thought about their culture and cultural preservation and uh, language memory. Uh, the, the biggest obstacle is, is, is time, really, just getting all those elements together and, and, and getting a prototype out quickly. Um, we want to make something meaningful. Well, it's, just, it's a little bit more, this is like more road trippy, so now I'm like thinking like we're on the road, you know, we want some cruise yeah. you know, yeah. more so than more, like more produced stuff, yeah. you know what I mean, more so than like just straight acoustic oh, yeah. um, piano or guitar. I think it'd be nice too if you keep the sound unified within each of the questions, so if, if even if you change the question, mm -hmm. that would be a great, that would be a great time to change the music. Right. I'm just gonna do like a like a round dance. Right. Go like 84 BPMs. A little faster. She wanted it closer. I was thinking like maybe like some some flute, you know? Pit stuff is better. Not so much like a language app or a language um, 
website. It's more about people's experience with their language and it, for people that are interested in preserving their culture and their language, they can check us out and, and um, see how other people are, are going about it and hear other people's stories. And we're going to break it down to sections where, you know, we have people that are intermediate speakers of their language, um, advanced speakers and beginners. We're, Indian right here. we're gonna ask them, how are you supporting your native culture, preserving it? And that's it, the interactive part for their website. And the, the eagle and the, the coyote are gonna kind of, they're gonna kind of be animated and moving moving around on the screen while, while you're hearing the audio that we're creating right now. So we're editing the audio content that we recorded yesterday. I'm creating just, you know, concepts that we can go off of and once our team like re-meets again we can look them over and see how they look and feel and, you know, still decide on, on stylistic, that, uh, you know, things and color and stuff like that. So. That's the landing page. Well, if he's gonna, I think he's gonna have the eagle flying in a good in like two weeks right there. So yeah. could run just across the bottom, like through the word language. Yeah. We're hoping it'll be an interactive thing that people can contribute to once we're done with this hackathon. So we already have about 12, 13 interviews that are part of the content now. But um, since it's gonna be uh, an open platform. We're going to make it so that people can keep submitting and keep participating with the conversation about language preservation and their, um, their road and their, their paths on that. There's no ego here. When, when you're coding, there's no ego. There's knowing that your code will always change, a website will always change, an app will always change. You just you kind of, uh, it's a bit of a philosophical approach, but knowing that it, it really depends on what you're creating. You let the creation take over. This will be a public repo, a repository, so what we're hoping is that other developers might want to branch off, fork it, contribute, check it back in, and then we have, we're starting a conversation here after the hackathon is over, hoping to keep this, keep this going. And we, we need help. We need help, so. Sio. How? Seoma. Danjo. Pagala. Jin Quinzi. Well, I think for me, being so far away from where I could um, literally immerse myself in my culture and language, I think it's really cool to have um, digital immersive options. I am of uh, the Koval Confederate Tribes um, from like the Nez Perce Band um, from Eastern Washington. And my, that's on my father's side, and my mother's side is uh, Navajo. Well, on my mother's side, um, my grandparents spoke Navajo. They were uh, uh, subjected to um, boarding schools where they were taught to try to forget their language. This whole platform that we're creating together is, you know, really unique. Um, a lot of the language um, platforms that are out there are really based around like um, words and phrases. Well, I never actually heard my language being spoken more than a word or two until I was in my 30s or 40s. And even then it was just a couple of three sentences from somebody who was talking. I didn't really get, I never really listened to people converse in the language. It means a lot, you know, like there's a lot of people out there without the resources. So we're kind of doing a lot in making, creating those resources. <laughs> You know, coming from my background in Navajo Nation, you know, our language is being endangered. So, being able to create coyotesandeagles.com means a lot to me, and I'm pretty sure for all of us here. Coyoteseagles.com. Coyoteseagles.com. It isn't just about the thrill of skateboarding for Nick and Kelly Lambesi. They craft skateboards too. My name is Nick Lambesi. I'm a craftsman, and making skateboards is my art. Longline Skateboards is a company that my husband and I started 
and it just grew out of our passion for surfing and which evolved into our passion for skating. Growing up in Florida, we've always been around the water. We'd go out surfing and I'll uh, hang out in big groups and, and, and just be out there all together and sometimes you can't go out surfing. So we started looking into these longer skateboards and this gives you that surf ride. So took it to the street, surf the sidewalk. I think I made my first skateboard when I was uh, I think around nine or ten years old. It took us probably ten years of doing it to make that perfect combination of wood where not only was it flexible and strong in the same token, but also light. No two of our skateboards are alike. Each one has kind of has its own personality and it's just there's something about you having a product or a thing that no one else has. You know, there's definitely a cool feeling about that. We press the, the wood together ourselves. It's a rough cutout, and all the boards are done in-house by hand. So all the sanding and everything is done by hand. And then staining or painting or anything like that. And we put them together and, and safely store them so they don't get all dusty in our very small shop, and away they go. Nick's definitely a craftsman, you know, and it, he definitely has an artistic eye. You can't not have an artistic eye and make a skateboard that gorgeous and that symmetrical and with the, the, all the details that he does. I never really considered it an art, but I guess building the skateboards is a, kind of an art. You're coming up with the, you know, all, all the schemes and the painting. That, to me, they look like old surfboards. It's, you're building something out of wood. You're, you're shaping it, you're sanding it. Comes natural. I think they're definitely pieces of art. Um, a lot of people, some people actually buy them to just hang on the wall. Um, some people, they always sell, tell us when, we, when they get the skateboards that they're almost too afraid to ride it because it's so nice. They don't want to scratch it. You know, it's kind of like your first drive in your brand new car. It's like, the scratch is going to happen, but you're going to cry a little bit when it does. Every skateboard, I would have to say, is on a, a personal level because every single one, there's not one square of the inch of the board that I haven't touched 50 times. You know what I mean? You're always trying to get every little mark right, all the lines straight. Yeah, it's definitely something I take very personal. He's so passionate about the process and everything that he does. And if it's not perfect, he's not done, you know? So it's, it's just a great way to just for him to thrive in that passion. One of the biggest challenges I think I face making the skateboards is to continue coming up with new designs. You can't just, you can't make the same old thing, the same old thing. So to always have a different shape and a different design and something that doesn't look repetitious, that's my biggest challenge. We've always been skating. You know, if there wasn't surf, then we would go skating. Sometimes you get going real fast down uh, steep bridges or something like that. It could be quite the adrenaline rush, like, you know, wipe any second to make it, and then when you make it and everybody's watching and you're a star for a second, you know. It's always just kind of been involved in our lives and it just gives you so much freedom. My inspiration for making the skateboards right now is just the fact that so many people are still into it. I thought it was always something that would fade and it seems to grow more than anything. The joy that you that I get to see on his face when he gives someone their skateboard and they start riding it, or he's out on with their, his friends cruising around on boards and just watching him watch them on the board he made is so it's just so awesome for me. It's just it's like awe inspiring kind of feeling. See, the thing that makes me the happiest is you're creating out of a couple of pieces of wood this skateboard that somebody's going to take and use and go ride to see their friends and they're gonna look at it and compare who's as fast or you know, who can do more tricks and just the, thing, the same thing that it brought to me when I was younger. <laughs> Making them and getting them out there and selling them to other young kids and it's, it's you know, the next generation coming up. To see that all come to life again, that's an awesome feeling. And that's why I keep doing it. The SMAG Dance Collective puts a new spin on modern dance. Who is Michael Grooms? Uh, Michael Grooms is an entertainer. Michael Grooms is someone that enjoys people, he loves to have fun, and he loves to uh, 
uh, interact with people, and more importantly, he loves to entertain people. Michael Grooms is also a dancer and choreographer and founder of Smag Dance Collective, a community-based dance troupe for the community, by the community. Smag's mission is to provide opportunity for dancers, uh, provide opportunity for people that we think would not get the opportunity otherwise. This could be because maybe they don't have the training, uh, maybe they need to spend more time at home with their children, any number of, of factors that would preclude them from dancing with another company. Dance is my passion. It's been a part of my life for my whole life. I love it. I love performing. Um, I love being able to give back what I love to the community. I got back into dancing because I was feeling unfulfilled. It's definitely an outlet for me, so I can't really picture not doing it because I've been there before and I was unhappy. <laughs> Ever since I was little, I was dancing around my house. Um, and I just never stopped. It is a huge joy for me and it's what I love to do. Part of our mission is to bridge the gap between artists and other artists in the community. So we've created uh, works that allow us to do that where we can have collaborations with other artists. And another uh, part of our mission is to educate and entertain diverse audiences. It's so different than anything I've ever done. So it's thrilling for me because I'm used to a stage with lights and wings and an audience right in front of you. But um, in different venues when you're outside, there's people all around you. Uh, we did a piece with the fountains on Monument Street. Sometimes we dance on brick and that's interesting because it's not a traditional dance floor. So it's just totally different and it's really thrilling for me. Our audience is unique and different. We've got primarily people that don't go to the theater watching what we're doing. And it's because of our philosophy of taking it to the people as opposed to the people coming to us to see what we're doing. We want people to feel comfortable and our street performances are designed to bring audiences to the table and necessarily not have them come to a theater. A lot of times people think in terms of going to a theater, they gotta get dressed up, they've gotta do all these special things to go to the theater. Dance should be accessible to everybody. A lot of times you have to pay um, 50 or 75 or 100 dollars to go see a show, um, but a lot of people just can't afford it. But just seeing us dance out on the street, like in the Oregon district, you know, they're already there. I think it's cool that it's put in their daily lives rather than, you know, having to dress up and spend all that money and go out. Street performances aren't the only things that set SMAG apart from other local dance companies. The style of dance also strays from the traditional. We're an adult company and we focus on a fusion of all types of styles. So we don't stick to just one style of dance. We um, pretty much do everything. We do ballet, modern, jazz, hip hop. To me, contemporary dance pushes the boundaries as well. I think it kind of breaks the rules a little bit. Ballet is all about holding your form. Uh, it's very important because it's the foundation in dance. Uh, but contemporary dance uh, allows a little more freedom. Contemporary dance is a form of training that uh, utilizes modern dance, it utilizes ballet, and it utilizes jazz techniques. And what it does is it creates a, a more uh, diverse dancer, uh, a dancer that can do everything as opposed to a dancer that can specialize in something. They can now do ballet, they can now do modern dance, and they can look comfortable doing it on stage. So it gives more flexibility to choreographers to be able to create with bodies like that. It's really interesting watching this phenomenon occur, which is people are, are starting to look at dancers as athletes and as dancers, we've always known all along that we're athletes and the reason we've known is, is the work that we do. And dance, you have to be able to do both right-handed and left-handed. So you have to be able to turn to your right, you have to be able to do turns to your left because choreographers, they're gonna want you to do both turns on the right and the left as well as be able to jump on your right and jump on your left. So you have to train both sides of your body to be equal. The athleticism has always been there and people are now starting to recognize and dancers. SMAG's Cadillac stage performance is the Urban Nutcracker. The idea started from a desire to diversify the traditional dance audience. How? For starters, replace the classic Nutcracker soundtrack with all popular music. Where the traditional Nutcracker takes place during a Victorian kind of setting in the 1800s, we now brought it forward to 2000. There's no resemblance to any of the Nutcracker soundtrack. 
Uh, and we did that on purpose because, again, we wanted to get away from the traditional soundtrack and do stuff that people can identify with from what they hear on the radio, in their cars, uh, at the clubs they go to and places like that. It's part of our seasonal performance series, which features Smagmare, which is like a haunted house nightmare production. That takes place on the street. Contemporary dance really never gets boring. There's really no boundaries. That's why I like it. In addition to holding full-time jobs, grueling rehearsals, and quarterly performances, these dancers also have a commitment to developing the next dance audience. We have a program called Dancing Across Dayton. It's our dad um, program where we like to offer an opportunity to kids who might not take dance on a regular basis. They may have never taken dance or been exposed to it. We reach out to schools in that community, community centers, anywhere we can just try and go and give kids a chance to see what dance is all about. We kind of teach them um, different fundamental bases of um, creative movement or just pedestrian movement, things that anybody could do, putting them in different dance sequences, rhythmic patterns, things like that. So it's just a way that we can share some of what we love with the community. We still need to develop that next audience, and if we don't develop them, then our discipline as dancers, as performing artists, is going to go away because we don't have an audience to watch it anymore. So we have to get in there and work with them younger. And not only that, but stimulate them from a, a creative perspective because they may be future dancers. Celebrating its 10th season, SMAG Dance Collective, led by Michael Grooms, does not lack in passion, creativity, nor experimentation. Sometimes I think that as dancers we tend to think it's more so about our artistic vision and, and what our voice is and we forget about the fact that without the people sitting out there in the audience watching us, our artistic vision or voice would be unheard. Nobody would care because it would just be about what we want. So it's a really self-serving moment at that point. I want to entertain people. I want to do something that's going to make them happy and make them feel good. So my choreography tends to revolve around that type of, of movement. Michael's so fun. <laughs> he has great choreography and he definitely brings a lot of joy to the group. He has a great personality and he just is all about dance, so we love him. <laughs> I'd rather die on stage. Uh, you know, I, I have no plans of retirement. Retirement is something that I couldn't even fathom doing. Uh, I'm gonna dance until I can't move and even if I'm in a wheelchair, I'll probably figure out a way of getting out there and, and doing something. An in-depth exhibit about mystery and intrigue with legendary detective Sherlock Holmes. In a lot of ways, I think that Sherlock Holmes was one of the first superheroes. He's the sort of superhero that you can hope to be. You know, I'm most likely not going to wake up tomorrow and be bitten by a radioactive spider and be able to climb a wall. But if I use my brain and I use my powers of deduction, perhaps I can become a little more like Sherlock Holmes than what I'm actually able to become. And I think folks really enjoy that element of the character. This is a 10,000 square foot exhibition that is all about Sherlock Holmes, the character, the evolution of the character from an idea in uh, Carton Doyle's mind all the way up to present day, and also a look at the forensic science that Holmes used in order to come up with his deductions. Visitors walking into this exhibit are immediately going to be greeted by some beautiful artifacts from the Conan Doyle estate, including actual pieces of the handwritten manuscript of the Hound of the Baskervilles, as well as some other, uh, some beautiful authentic art that appeared in the, both the American and the British versions of the Sherlock novels. And then as they continue on, they're going to get to try their hand at becoming Sherlock Holmes. When folks come into the exhibition, they receive their crime journal that they get to take with them throughout the exhibition. And this is going to be where they are going to record the results of their studies that they look at. So they are going to be examining things like codes inside of newspapers. You're going to get a chance to look at uh, 
at ballistics, at the way that a bullet travels, and look at uh, different uh, plant samples and see if those plant samples are actually poisonous or if they're not. You're going to get to look at the way that uh, boots make tracks over sand. You know, boots tra tracked over the sand as they're being drugged look much different than boots walking back and forth over the course of that sand. So those are some of those places where you really have to use your keen eye and your ability to observe the scene in order to tell if you can really decide what's going on. It is such a fantastic combination of hands-on science and real uh, Sherlockian artifacts. We are all about hands-on science. So any exhibition where folks can get in and actually manipulate the science, the forensic science that we talk about in, inside of the International Exhibition of Sherlock Holmes is fantastic for us. This is only the uh, second place where this exhibit has been in the country, and also we are very fortunate in COSI. This is going to be the exhibition's only stop east of the Mississippi for the next four or five years. So it's pretty exclusive to be able to have this here in Columbus, Ohio. This time on Colores, National Heritage Fellow, Santa Fe Santero Ramon Jose Lopez shares how his rich heritage influences his artwork. Este es mi abuelito, He's standing in front of this chapel. But but here's here's a little quote that I made: the Santeros die, but their work remains. Pueblo storyteller Larry Littlebird shares the importance of learning to listen. Listening to what's within is what the stories are, are really, truly about. I had a good life, but it slipped right through my fingertips. I thought Albuquerque I poet Carlos Contreras shares how words and poetic insight can make real change. I care because somebody has to. It's hard as like a golden microphone trying to hold a conversation with a broke speaker. Until next time, thank you for watching. Funding for Polores was provided in part by Frederick Hammersley Foundation.